Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Head into your local Safeway for great spring savings throughout the store. This week at Safeway, get yellow peaches or nectarines for the member price of $1.88 per pound. Also this week at Safeway, value packs of Signature Farms chicken drumsticks, thighs, leg quarters, or picnic packs are buy one, get one free. Plus, get value packs of USDA Choice Boneless Beef Top Sirloin Steak for the member price of $4.99 per pound. Visit Safeway.com, download the Safeway for You app, or head in store to find more great deals at Safeway. Wherever you may hail, I'm your host, John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus. Join us as we explore some of Australia's and the world's most fascinating and important contemporary developments, shedding a spot of light in a world filled with alternative fact darkness. Today, we're joined by Michael Sullivan, who is lecturer at the College of Business, Government and Law at Flinders University, South Australia. Our topic for this episode, China. Michael, welcome to The Focus. Good to see you again, John. Thank you. Michael, let's start off with a big one, shall we? There has been a lot said recently in the media about the threat the People's Republic of China poses to the island of Taiwan. What did you make of the People's Liberation Army Air Force overflights over Taiwan's air defense identification zone? Okay, a couple of points. China has been in tense relations with Taiwan since 1949. So what we've been witnessing just the last few weeks is probably not unusual in historical context, though what China is doing is um, is probably on a bigger scale than it's been able to do before. And I think that's probably one of the points. Uh, this has been provocative uh, because there's debate about the relations between Taiwan and the United States. Um, so it's making a big point to Taiwan not to go there. But secondly, I think because China has rapidly developed its Air Force capacity over the last, well, it's over the last five, 10 years, but it really now feels confident that it can deploy significant forces um, to make a point. And and that's what it's doing. And I think also that it's actually probably training. If we're going to invade Taiwan, what's our Air Force going to be doing? So let's go and practice. And I think that's also what they're doing. So it's trial and error, it's testing things, it's seeing what can be done, what's going to work, what's not going to work. That I don't think is a worrying thing because I don't think war between the two is likely anytime soon. That could change if things go downhill in China economically. There's quite a few issues that the government is confronting there. So a distraction with a a fight with Taiwan may just give the Communist Party sort of a legitimacy having an external enemy uh, that it's lost because it hasn't been able to sustain economic development for for its people. So there are some real risks there, I think, but it's a display of force, it's a display of um, of bravado, it's telling the Taiwanese not to uh, go there, re the United States, and it's telling the United States and its allies like Australia that we're playing with fire if we, if we want to pursue Taiwanese independence. I don't think anybody w- wants to, but um, if we want to just support Taiwan in some of its initiatives further than uh, the Chinese Communist Party feels this legitimate. So there are some red lines here in the sand that uh, the Communist Party is just warning us not to, to test. One of the things that I've noticed, Michael, is that the media reportage about Taiwan gives the impression that the Taiwanese are all behind their government. And yet, when you look a little bit further into Taiwanese politics, you note that there is a, a significant minority that is either dubious of not pertaining to the one uh, one country, two systems policy, mm. or who just want to avidly join up with the mainland. So can you give us some sort of sense of how divided is Taiwan's internal politics in this whole matter? Well, it is internally divided, and it has been since it um, 
became a democracy and it's a very vibrant, lively democracy. So we shouldn't be surprised in a democracy, a liberal democracy, well, not quite liberal, but that, that there are a variety of views. Independence is a, a small, well, not a small minority, it's probably growing, but is a minority view. The status quo versus and uh, reunification at some stage are the majority positions in Taiwan. So I think we in the West have to be careful that we don't talk up oh, the Taiwanese who want independence are being suppressed. That's just not the case. I think the Taiwanese are very, very concerned about, um, about interference by the United States, not only by China. It's sort of pushing up the, uh, the rhetoric about independence and defending freedom and democracy and seeing Taiwan as a, a test case for the rule of law and the international legal uh, system and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Taiwan's not quite like that. And I don't think those types of views are, are strongly reflected in, in Taiwanese domestic politics. Um, th there is a, a, a strong, a small and growing minority, yeah, that do want that. And I think this is, you know, Beijing's concern is to nip that in the bud to make sure that that doesn't uh, grow any stronger with international support. So that that's the, uh, I guess, the other reason why these shows of force and then, and I guess, intimidation of the Taiwanese and its international supporters uh, are on display at the moment, just to make sure that, that the Taiwanese don't go down that track. So how has China's political crackdown in Hong Kong played to fears over the preservation of the status quo regarding Taiwan? Well, it's made it much harder for Beijing, actually, because uh, Beijing has always argued that the, the Hong Kong model, the one uh, one country, two system model was the way that um, that Taiwan and China should go in the future. And that it, it's really interesting in principle, they've actually agreed on that a long time ago, but they've never agreed on, uh, on what one country, two systems actually meant, the very different interpretations. So they could never actually narrow the gap on what they actually meant. The crackdown in Hong Kong um, just makes that so much harder for Beijing to articulate a case to Taiwan that, you know, we, we can work together under a one country, two systems um, uh, scenario. And Taiwan just has to say, well, sorry, but look at Hong Kong, what you're doing there. We don't want to go down that path. So this has actually set back, I think, those political uh, relations between Beijing and, and Taiwan. And it's pretty much all Beijing's uh, fault because it sees, it sees Hong Kong as part of China, as it does Taiwan, obviously, but it, it sees Hong Kong as, as just getting a little bit too uppity and, and uh, Beijing is just making the point that you are part of China and you're now going to play by our rules, um, not by your own more independent rules. That's not a good lesson to be sending or message to be sending to Taiwan. Um, but I think Beijing is obviously prepared to play this hardball game with Hong Kong and then manage the negative consequences of its relations with Taiwan. We in the West see that as a negative, understandably and probably correctly, because it does heighten tensions in, in the Taiwan Straits. And as I said, we're seeing that at the moment. Going back um, uh, to what we were saying earlier about the internal dynamics within Taiwan itself, the, the fact that the current leadership is effectively, you know, touting the pro-independence line, how, how does this rallying around the flag situation um, um i mean is there is there a, a, an element of rallying around the flag the more pressure china places on taiwan the more likely those people who are sitting on the fence who are not really committing either one way or the other, or the other will see it in their interest to back the government that is touting defense yeah uh, the, 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 the independence i should say independence. yeah I, I think that's a real risk um the way that China manages this is actually to ramp up pressure, not to reduce pressure. And it can and has in the past uh, ramped up economic pressure. Well, five years or six years ago, after the election of the current government, there was, you know, they were moving towards restrictions on mainland uh, opportunities in Taiwan, visits and things. And, and, the, and, and Beijing said, OK, there'll be no more Chinese tourists going to, to Taiwan. And all of a sudden, all these shopping malls in Taipei and around the country in the tourist spots had no, no visitors coming from the mainland, up, up, upon which they were almost totally dependent. And the outcry economically from them, because they were losing their livelihood, was great, so great that Taiwan actually backed down. So I think if there is any movement as a result of this towards 
greater support for independence or greater autonomy or or whatever in Taiwan, and that gets reflected politically, China will just ratchet up the economic pressure because despite their political differences, the economies are, are interdependent. I mean, they're dependent on each other. China is probably more dependent on Taiwan economically than Taiwan is. So they've got very, very close economic ties. I mean, most semiconductors that China relies upon, especially the top shelf ones come from Taiwan. So they're not really in a position to uh, antagonize the Taiwanese all that much, but I think there's still a fair bit of room for, for both sides to be just playing this political game against each other. And I think we've seen that in the Taiwanese calls to like us in Australia to, you know, the, the, the Taiwanese foreign minister saying we're preparing for war and uh, you know, that's pretty heated rhetoric uh, and calling on Australia and the allies to support it. Uh, if, if China does attack. So that's a, that's just a manifestation of this. I, I just, it's, an, it's an uptake in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the pressures and the tensions that we've just seen on and off the last 70 years or thereabouts. Um, so whether this is any different from previous uh, upticks in tensions, we'll, we'll, we'll find out if there's war, then we'll say it is. If it isn't, then um, we'll know that this is sort of a fairly regular pattern. To what degree has the mainstream media, especially here in Australia, bought into the idea that the PRC is a clear and present direct military threat? I think it's uh, hook, line and sinker. The, I think the consensus was reached in Australia among our uh, defence planners and strategic thinkers, with a few, few exceptions, that uh, China does pose that threat and that we need to start preparing for that contingency that war may happen, um, probably with the United States over the South China Sea or in the East China Sea with Japan or over Taiwan uh, sooner rather than later. So I think that that is the dominant view now. So the way I put it is when we go around the room among our, our planners and the question is asked by say the minister or, you know, uh, what are we going to do about China? The question is not, is China a threat or a real threat to Australia? The question is, given that China is a threat, uh, what are we going to do about it? And that, there's a clear difference between the two. So there's not much room now to view China as anything but uh, a challenge and a threat. And the worrying thing about that is it's, I call it sort of the national security prism. And we obviously need a national security prism uh, to test and assess everything. But when it's the dominant form of assessments and diplomacy is in the background and our economic relations are in the background and our ties with students coming here, tourists coming here, us going up to China to teach and tourists going there, all, that, all those other dimensions of our relationship, when they're in the background and are basically dysfunctional, as some of them seem to be now, and that national security prism dominates, that's worrying for me because if a Chinese company wants to invest in Melbourne or Adelaide, what do we do? Is that a national security threat? We ask that question first. And I think that's a significant shift from what we used to do even a few years ago. We'd obviously look at the national security implications, but it was part of all of those other dimensions. Now that national security dimension is, is the dominant uh, dimension. That's not to say that there are sort of other, there, there are economic relations that have that are continuing. So Chinese are continue to invest here and companies are looking for investment opportunities. So there is a level at which it's sort of not quite business as usual, but it's not all forlorn, but it's, hmm, uh, I just don't like that dominance of the national security prism at which we look at, at China. So China's academic comes here. Has he got connections with the PLA that what his research here or her research here may be feedback into the Chinese military industrial complex. That's the first question we're asking. It's the first question we actually ask our universities to assess before they make decisions about which China scholars and academics and, and students that they'll, they'll allow in and what projects they'll be allowed to work on. Michael, yeah. isn't that actually reasonable though? Because you, you know the way that uh, China presented itself as a direct threat to Australia, first and foremost was as an intelligence threat, as a trade threat, as a cyber threat, you know, these kind of uh, more nuanced threats, you know, they didn't come with us 
uh, holding their missiles and threatening us with annihilation. They came carrying the, uh, you know, the 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 the, the peace the peace dove, the peace dove that is uh, capitalist development. You know, we make money, you make money, everyone's happy, we all go home happy. Yeah. Uh, now, in you know, using that as a cover, some pretty significant things had happened, especially when it came to supporting Australia's political parties. Now, we can say that, you know, China saw an opportunity and it used it because we were stupid enough to allow political parties to have donations from God knows where, no one really checked uh, up until recently. So is not there a sense of, yeah, I understand that there is a, a bit of panic going on in our political circles. We have overly securitized mm-hmm. our relationship with China. But, you know, they did do certain things that made us go down this path, too. It's not just about them being good guys, we being knuckle dragon, uh, you know, diplomatic Neanderthals, although, I mean, there is a case to be made there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's another question, yeah. Um, yeah. I think you're right. But I think those issues, what's interesting about all those issues, and we can catalogue them, and but they've all been caught out by Australia. We all know about them, and we've we've dealt with them, I think, fairly effectively. I, some In some instances, we may have gone a little bit too far. And that's our message to China. Um, you, you can try these things, but you're not going to get away with them. And that's probably one of the strengths of our, you know, and the resilience of our political system. I don't think we then need to basically go to a blanket paranoid, which I think it is, um, fear of whatever China is saying or doing or trying to do is is, is some sort of threat. So you're probably right, the Chinese probably shot themselves in the foot on a number of occasions because they have gone over overboard. Um, The other other side of that, I mean, the, the digital, the cyber stuff, yeah, I mean that's that's very active and and very strong. But we do the same to China. I mean, we're we're not just a, a cyber engaged in cyber defence. We're we're engaged in cyber offence as 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 well. And a lot of that's directed against China. So this is just a tit for tat um, game in many ways, a, a, a dangerous game because errors can be made, mistakes can be made, miscalculations, misperce- misperceptions always come into the calculations when everybody's sort of getting really, really tense with each other. And that's two sides. That's us and the Americans on one side of the alliance and, and China on the other side. So my, my real fear is that one day, either side, one of, one of the sides, either us or the Chinese are gonna miscalculate on something. And who knows what the result's going to be. So I'd like to just sort of step back a little bit, deal with the, 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 the issues that China worries us about and give space for the other things that for 20 years we, we took from China and we gave to China and everybody sort of worked. I wish we could do a little bit more of that um, as, as well as just keeping a closer eye on, yeah, on those security issues that are important. Well, speaking of important security issues, we have the Quad 2.0, and we now have AUKUS. Have they successfully created a strategic bulwark in the Indo-Pacific against possible Chinese military provocations? Um, No. Um, To the extent that there is a successful military and strategic bulwark against Chinese expansion, it's it's, it's ANZUS, if you want to focus on Australia. The... The Quad and and especially the AUKUS, uh, I th- well the Quad probably less so, but AUKUS is just is just an addition. So we've got a bilateral, trilateral, and quadrilateral relationship. And the only one of those that actually mentions China is the bilateral relationship. If you go through all of the key documents, leader statements from well, there's only been one from AUKUS, I think, and the two leader statements and some of the other uh, administ administer the statements and things from from the Quad, China's not mentioned. Uh, China is just not mentioned. The the word China is just not mentioned. Um, And I just wonder why, if if this is about containment or balance of power, why don't we just out ourselves and say this is what it's about because we're in fear of China. And uh, we talk about being in fear of China and the de- rapidly deterior- deteriorating strategic situation in the Indo-Pacific, you know, those talking points we hear all the time. Well, 
if, if that is the case, why don't we just name China as the cause of that? And this is all designed to balance against China or contain it. So I just wonder why we're not, well, I think I know why, because India and Australia in particular are not too, com and even Japan, just not too comfortable fit politically naming China because they know that we'll cop uh, a political backlash from China. And we've already copped a <laughs> for two or three years, a significant reaction from negative reaction from China. So until I actually read a, uh, a Quad's leader statement that says, um, we're, we're establishing a balance of power against uh, China, because China threats, is a threat to the region and you're all threatened, come and join us. If it's not that game, what is the purpose of it? Surely it must be more than just to have a, a regional vaccine outroll program for, for the Pacific, which is all it's basically doing at the moment. Surely, why do we need a quad to do that? So if it's more than that, which I think it obviously is, when is it going to come out and actually acknowledge that and let's get on with it? So if, why would we be worried about the reaction from China if we're seriously going to try and contain it? or have a balance of power against it. Let's get on and do it. And well, I, I actually agree with you. I mean, I think it's ridiculous uh, for us to, to take a step back and say, well, we're not going to name the elephant in the room, but we all know what that elephant is. And we're all going to take measures to defend ourselves against being trampled by the elephant. But, you know, we won't give it name because if mm. we give it a name, we give it power. Or maybe it's something along the lines of, we won't name China just in case we will have some sort of back channel diplomacy happening. And we don't want to cheese off the pragmatists who are sitting somewhere behind Xi in the plenary, you know, uh, in, in, in back row, 500 seats down, you know. So, so if we do have like uh, this, this ability to reach back, uh, naming China would probably say you're naming the entire CCP, you're naming the entire people, and so therefore they're the enemy. And in actual fact, what we want to do is we want to split the elements that we find not so pleasant to deal with, as opposed to lumping everything together and saying China is the threat, we have to defend against China, right? You've, you've raised a really good point there because... Um... We don't know, and I think I don't know whether there are intelligence agencies know any more than we do in the public domain. They may do. Uh, the assumption is that Xi Jinping is 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 running a, a fairly united country, and he's he's doing that partly by trying to deliver on on uh, economic prosperity and social stability, but he's also eliminating uh, opponents uh, through his anti-corruption campaign, which has been going on since 2013. This is not just uh, a day by day, let's you know get through rid of a few corrupt people. Uh, this is coming up nine, nine years next year that he's uniting the country behind him. But it may be the case that there are disaffected leaders within business, within the government, because the government isn't the same as the party. There is a really large, uh, well-educated, sophisticated government apparatus that wants to get on with governing the country, and is not necessarily all that happy with the type of political intervention that is now imposed pretty much on every act, act, activity and every ministry and department and, you know, and, and that ideologically political correctness that is now demanded, just not happy. But So whether there are opposition groups and movements behind the scenes in China within the high ranks of the Communist Party that are not happy, I don't know, and it may be the case that, that this strategy is, is designed to send political signals in, indirectly, but hopefully they're read correctly yeah. by the Chinese leadership that, that the international community doesn't support Xi Jinping, they support China, and make try and make those differences that we will support you if there are changes. I don't know. It's, that's a really risky strategy if that's what we're doing uh, because it can backfire and the hardliners within the regime mm -hmm. uh, who are the nationalists in the PLA who want a harder line against Taiwan and us in the United States, they could seize the moment out of this if there's any dissension and, and political instability within the, the ruling echelons of the, of, of the party. So it's a high risk strategy. But I don't think we know. So again, we'll just have to wait and see how this pans out. 
Yeah, definitely. So what do you think of the state of diplomacy between Xi's China and Biden's America? I mean, where's the pragmatism gone, Michael? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've seen a few, a few sort of snippets and instances of a sort of green sprouts emerging, but whether they're going to die off or, or actually weeds and not sprouts, productive sprouts, we don't know yet. It was good that the, the Chinese military and the, the US uh, Defence Forces met for a couple of days just early this week or late, late last week. We've got some economic discussions going on and the announcement today that uh, Xi and, and, and Biden will have a, a virtual leaders summit later in the year. They're sort of positive things, but they're sort of uh, not, not enough yet to, to hang your hat on. I've just noticed that there are concerns in the, Ameri in the United States among its, its commentators about the coherence of the US-China strategy. I think on paper, there's sort of a coherent strategy there, but its delivery, uh, there are concerns. Uh, uh, some of the, the sort of key supporters, I think, of the strategy have expressed some, some concerns. Uh, and on the other hand, I've got no doubts in China, there's an equally big debate going on among the, uh, uh, the, the, the ruling policymaking elite about how to handle Biden and the, and the foreign policy. There hasn't been much, there's not much difference at all, if any, between uh, the, the sort of the pragmatic uh, dimensions of Trump's policy and Biden's policy. The, the, the atmospherics and the language has changed quite significantly, uh, which is good. So we've moved from that Pompeo you know, cold, uh, ideological good versus evil, light versus darkness warfare uh, language to a much more, these are our interests, these are your interests, and let's sort of see if we can work this out pragmatically. But the fact that, that John Kerry, the US climate change advisor, you know, climate change is an issue that China and the United States need to work on, obviously. And it was for, I think, the Americans a no-brainer that when John Kerry went to Beijing uh, six weeks ago, whatever, uh, that the Chinese would sit down and, and, yeah, we can work on this. And the Chinese said, no, um, here are our list of other things we want to work on while we're working on climate change with you. Uh, and I think that caught the US by surprise that the Chinese didn't just accept that the Americans, here's, here's our terms and conditions uh, to negotiate climate change, will you? And the Chinese said, no, we're not going to accept your terms and conditions. We've got, we've got our own terms and conditions. Can we negotiate on those? So I think the, Ameri the United States, they've sort of that, that set them back a little bit. And the US trade, uh, what's her name? I forget her name, doesn't matter. Um, who's just been in Beijing or about to go, she, the expectations that they would sit down and, and negotiate over some of the Trump era economic uh, things, and she came with nothing. They were the Chinese were really surprised that there was nothing there that the Biden administration was prepared to sit down and negotiate. Look, we'll 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 work with you on this and uh, we'll reduce some of these Trump era uh, tariffs and things. But she, I think, just wanted to sound out the Chinese position. So I think there's still a lot of uncertainty on both sides about how to treat the other side. We're not even 12 months into the Biden administration, so I think we've got to give them time to find their feet a little bit. They wrote a lot uh, before they were appointed the, the key players in the China game, the Indo-Pacific game, during the Trump, late Trump administration period about how they saw... Uh, the China-US relationship it, under a Biden presidency. So they're still trying to work out how to translate their ideas into uh, policy. So that's a learn, an upward learning curve for them, despite the fact that many of them are really, really experienced. They know how to work in Asia. So I feel, still think they're trying to work out you know, their, their current interests with how they know China works and just get, get all that together. You, know, you don't do that overnight. So I'm not surprised that there's you know, some issues with just making this work. As I said, it's less than 12 months into the Biden presidency. So you just got to cut them some slack. And the Chinese will be working on how to respond as well. Well, you could say that, you know, we need to cut them some slack, but I see that the Republicans won't be cutting them slack no. anytime soon. No. Now, with regard to that, you know, the, those recent Senate hearings saw General Milley come up and say that he had to reach back to his Chinese counterpart to ensure that they understood that, you know, President, the former President Trump 
was, uh, well, blowing a lot of hot air and he wasn't necessarily going to blow up the world because, you know, it was his out of the deal approach to everything. <laughs> so what, what did you think about that? Well, I was, I was surprised in the sense that um, they often do talk to each other regularly. And I think uh, General Milley has made the point subsequently that this was fairly routine that, um, you know, I, I have to talk to my Chinese interlocutors, you know, sort of off the record, sort of second track diplomacy type stuff, I guess, rather than the formal stuff that states do with each other. But I didn't buy that at all as a justification or an explanation for why I did it. This was, for, you know, this was normal for me to do, uh, because what he said was, we know that you think we're going to go to war with you. Now, when was the last time that um, the Americans rang the Chinese up over the last 70 years and said, look, don't worry what you're hearing. We're not going to go to war with you, whatever you think. I just think that was the fact that US intelligence was telling them that Chinese intelligence was making judgments about maybe Trump will pull the trigger here mm. and just to reassure them that we won't. And then Millie, I think, well, it hasn't acknowledged, but in the in in the book which re revealed this, that Milley was putting into place contingency plans to disobey presidential orders if if that order came through. On the basis, there is a, a trigger in the chain of command that if you get a an unlawful order from the president, you can uh, how you define unlawful. But the mm. fact that they were getting seemed to me towards that. There must have been great concern within, yeah. within the US establishment and great concern within the Chinese establishment as oh, well. Yeah. 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 So, that, yeah. so I just did, did not buy the fact that, that was normal sort of uh, back channel or second track uh, communication. Um, you don't tell the other side that you're not going to go to war against them. I mean, Cuban Missile Crisis might be the last time we saw something equivalent. It's really worrying. Tells yeah. us about their intelligence each uh, intelligence agencies and how they operate. Well, certainly, it tells us something about the Trump administration and that you know we all were quite justified to be rather scared of it because it was it was effectively unpredictable. And Trumpism is not dead because I think Trumpism has been kept alive for twenty twenty four. See how that plays out. So that's the other thing that worries me as well. And I think in Beijing, there's a sense that uh, that the, the that Washington is so deep, well, American politics is so deeply divided politically at the elite level, but also you know, class and, and society uh, and race and things that, uh, that there is a real possibility that that, that Trump pissed agenda, whether it's Donald Trump again, or one of his growing band of supporters, could be anyone in the, in, in the Republican party, they also be supporting Trump at the moment, uh, yep. could be back in power in 2024. So, and Xi Jinping will probably still be in power in 2024 unless there's a coup against him or he retires. Ill health, dodgy prawn. Health, yep, yeah, who knows? Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, so they're probably thinking about, you know, that's, that's fairly short term for the Chinese, but they must be thinking because there's no obvious successor or succession planning that anybody knows about. So, you know, we've got the... You know, the next big party congress, which is the 20th, which uh, is November next year, uh, which one assumes that he will continue on because he's you know, made it possible for him to continue on. Yeah, so he'll go well into his 70s, which, of course, makes him much younger than either Joe Biden or a potential Donald Trump president in 2024. Yeah, let's not split split hairs yeah, between yeah, the uh, really septuagenarians and octogenarians in power. Yeah, true. <laughs> I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast, and we're speaking with lecturer at Flinders University, Dr. Michael Sullivan, on the People's Republic of China. Michael, what can you tell our audience about Xi Jinping and the direction he has taken his country? I often tell my students this, and I do this myself. I, I ask them to... Uh, just place yourself where Xi Jinping is and, and where he's sitting and what he's surveying and looking at. And I can, when I do that, I can understand what he's trying to do. I don't think it's going to work. I think the, it is full of 
significant contradictions, which may just blow the place up. And not a, not any time soon, I don't think. But if these contradictions, which is a very Chinese way of actually looking at this, uh, get worse and worse, then the party's not going to be able to control this. That he he sees the party's control, political control over all aspects of Chinese life, whether you're uh, a film star or uh, a Jack Ma, or a, a very powerful entrepreneur, that you've got to be within the party camp and, and within the party clamp as well, that anything outside that is a threat to stability. So the party under Xi Jinping has been progressively and probably accelerating this over the last two or three years, just bringing everybody, you know, it started with lawyers and environmentalists and NGOs probably three years ago, four years ago, when it was clamped down. So now it's just going to all aspects. So actresses and actors and, uh, um, and, and the entrepreneurs and also the big companies. Now the private companies will be allowed to be private and to act, but they have to be within the political constraints that the party sets. And I think that's all geared to the party believing that it can achieve its goals, uh, but it needs everybody un under the umbrella of the party to do that. And if anybody's outside, that's a threat to the party achieving its goals. Now, this isn't going to work because it's a contradiction. You can't have the private sector encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation that's in an ideological straight jacket uh, by the party. That just won't work. Uh, you're angering your scientists and your entrepreneurs, the people that will make it work if they're, <clears throat> if they're allowed to make it work relatively free of, of party control. Now, the party will always exercise overall control, but its day-to-day -day control can be minimal as it was uh, progressively in the 80s and 90s, apart from 89. And now it's just reverted back to every aspect of daily life, really. I think most Chinese get on with life and don't really feel that directly. But the key groups that are driving the agendas towards uh, prosperity and, uh, and its key goals, uh, which are long-term goals, a strong and wealthy Chinese nation, uh, are really worried about the, the, the politics of this and the, and the direction. So I think there are grounds internally for, 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 for the politics to uh, revolt against the, the current direction. Now, as I said before, we don't know whether any in the elite uh, accept that or whether they all back Xi Jinping's moves here. We just don't know that. I think the 20th Party Congress next year will be pretty important in giving us uh, directions and indeed the build up to the Congress. So Chinese politics next year is going to be really, really interesting just for signs of any dissent, any shifts, uh, because Xi Jinping has been a prevailed upon to, to change direction. I don't think so. But from where he sits, it's about order and stability. And without any of that, both of those, all of the other goals cannot be achieved. Xi Jinping comes from two, two places here, from the Soviet Union's breakup. You know, his lesson and the party's lesson is that Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s weakened the Communist Party to a point that it couldn't control and it lost control. And look what happened to the Soviet Union. If we lose control, we're going to suffer the same fate. And China will. They had the warlord period of the 1920s when China had no effective national government. And, it, and each local, there were about six or seven of them, ran China, fought each other and went to war against each other and ran their areas. Um, and that's a likely scenario if from Xi Jinping's perspective. But you know, he, he grew up as a, a college kid or a high, late high school kid during the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, where the party fell apart in China. And his family and he, person, he himself personally you know, suffered enormously, as did a lot of, uh, of, of the ruling elite and their children and their families and their connections. But his lesson from that, it was the, the breakup of the party by Mao that caused those problems. His solution, his answer is very simple, don't break the party up. So he, he's taken the opposite perspective, I think, on the rule of the Communist Party, that what we in the West may have thought, this guy was a victim of the Cultural Revolution, he must take the Communist Party. No, it's the exact opposite. 
the Communist Party must come first at all, at all costs um, if China is to stay together and to become prosperous and powerful. And I think that's what we're seeing. He's not doing this because he's a nasty megalomaniac dictator. He's a genuine believer in, in, in what he's doing politically. Uh, aren't they aren't they the the people that we have to really be afraid of i mean true believers yeah, in true. any cause right yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, well, one of the things that i, I want to uh, take uh, take you up on uh, michael is the idea that you mentioned earlier you know that if he oversteps you know he may get some significant pushback from people within the party who are kind of unhappy with the day-to-day -day micromanagement of how they go about their lives so how do average Chinese people, as far as you're aware, uh, take to the whole notion of that whole social credit surveillance state sort of thing that's grown up under Xi? It's, it's a hard question to answer because the evidence we have from surveys and reports and things is that most Chinese probably buy the selling message from the government that this is a positive thing for you. This is smart... And it, it is, it's, these aren't either or choices. There's the surveillance security dimension of this um, technology, and there's the smart city dimensions of this. And the two go together, unfortunately. I wish we could actually sort of hive off the, the bad stuff and not do it and keep the good stuff. Uh, you know, and smart cities is, is not just a Chinese phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. Um, because if you can get your traffic flowing <laughs> you know, smoothly and less less pollution and stuff, then there are positive things that come from its use of the technology. But it is a surveillance state, an increasingly powerful surveillance state. Most Chinese from the evidence I think we've got, and I just don't know how widespread this, actually support it because they've been told this will catch the bad guys. And if you're not a bad guy, you've got nothing to fear. You'll get a yeah. positive credit. If you're a bad guy, you'll get a negative credit. Um, and a lot of Chinese think that's a good idea. <laughs> so I don't know how, how you manage to get around that because, I mean, we have a similar problem here. I mean, we're surveilled all the time here differently, but I'm more worried about Facebook surveillance of me and uh, the private platforms surveillance because they're collecting the data and they're using the data to tell me what I need to buy tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to buy tomorrow, but Facebook probably already knows. And it's probably, it's going to tell me nine o'clock in the morning that I need to go and buy this. That's what worries me. So I think a lot of the, the Chinese get on with their daily lives. And I think they've got used to, like we have with, you know, doing QR codes for uh, when we go into a shopping center or into a service station, it just becomes second nature. And if you're not a bad guy, you've got nothing to fear. Same argument we use here. If you don't break the speed limit, you won't get a speeding fine. So what's the problem? We often hear that China is this great engine of global economic growth, a country that will inevitably surpass the largest economy in the world, that of the United States. But less is said of the shaky ground China rests on. For instance, there's the Evergrande problem. It's probably more manageable because the Chinese state won't let it become a Lehman's Brothers solution. I mean, the, the US government let the market determine uh, Lehman Brothers' outcome. The Chinese won't let the market, uh, the Chinese government, the Communist Party won't let the market uh, determine the outcome. So I don't think it's, it's going to be the same. Having said that, I mean, it has certainly sent real shutters through global markets because everybody's exposed to it. And the, the part of the problem here is that during the global financial crisis 10 years ago, China had little exposure to uh, sort of the, the, the global problems that were causing that. It, its banking system and its, its, its money markets were not really all that interconnected. You know, when it went on the, the infrastructure uh, stimulus spree to keep itself out of going down because of the crisis, you know, a lot of that was debt. And so they built up a huge amount of domestic debt, none of them national level so much, but at the local level, the government, the state level or the provincial level. And the only way that they've been able to manage that is to adopt Western practices of, of bonds. And, you know, Chinese provinces could never issue bonds, for example, until probably two or three years ago. So they've loosened up the, the constraints over because the Communist Party was awful, fear, always fearful that these capitalist practices of creating debt to trade debt would, all, would one day 
get the system into into real trouble and the experiences of the capitalist west west can confirm that they had little choice but to fully embrace that system themselves and now they may be sort of getting really really worried about the fact that what they thought might be when you do this uh, a, a debt default somewhere that brings the system down um, that's what they're really, really worried about. That could be the underlying structural problem that's been exposed by the Evergrande case, which has sort of brought some of these issues to account. But having said that, the West has been really, really happy to buy up tens of billions of dollars of Chinese debt and bonds and because they saw it as, as, as an opportunity to make money. So we're sort of, we encourage the Chinese to go down this, this type of path. This is what we do. This is what Wall Street does it, how, how we do it. And we make a lot of money. So if you do it, you might be able to make a lot of money as well. So whatever happens, we're in it. If China can manage to save or sell off the bad debt, what they're going to do, I think, or what they're doing is if you're a state-owned enterprise and you've got not too bad debt problems and you can manage taking on some more debt, instead of going into more debt yourself, you're going to have to buy some of Evergrande's debt. So if they get 20 or 30 or 100 companies to actually buy chunks of Evergrande debt, it's not going to cause them problems. That will reduce the pressure and force Evergrande to sell off at, at uh, fire sale prices their non-essential assets to, to other companies that might be willing to take them on. So I think that's how they're trying to manage it at the moment, whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, but I think it tells me that the Chinese economy, despite the fact that it is state-owned and dominated by the Communist Party, has a lot of the weaknesses and the challenges of a, a freewheeling market economy that relies on creation of debt and issuance of bonds and things, which is a relatively new phenomena for, for the Chinese economy. And they're not going to be any different from, from dealing with challenges and issues, because there's going to be some bad debt, whatever, and there's going to be some bonds that don't deliver and one of these issues one day might cause problems so we've got to watch Evergrande the, uh, very closely for the next couple of months at least um, I think the worst from what I've been reading might be over but that's famous last words from me I mean they have defaulted a little bit on a couple of things not major but it just takes one of those defaults on a bond repayment or an interest repayment for somebody to panic and sell off and then to cause a, a contagion very, very quickly. So the Chinese economy is now, to me, looking like a, a Western economy did in the lead up to the, 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 the great financial crisis. Uh, it's got those same types of issues. I am curious about that because you've got, uh, as you say, you know, this, this, this brewing crisis. But over the other side of the Pacific, you've got another economic crisis. And because... The American economy is tied up to the Chinese economy, whether they want to admit to it or not. If, for instance, the debt ceiling of the United States is not passed and there's a shutdown, what would happen if the Chinese decided to panic at the thought of an American economic shutdown because they're not raising the debt ceiling for the United States? Yeah. Because there, 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 there are... Chinese monies and American monies being traded on both sides of the Pacific, and something that can happen in the United States could have a profound impact on, on the Chinese economy, couldn't yeah. it? It's really, really hard to, to know that because your default position was that the Chinese government would know how to respond to that and would deal with it. But I don't think they would. If that happened, all hell would break loose and the Chinese government would have lost control over the economic fallout from that. And that that is not what they want to do. They want to be able to control. They've got so many different policy levers, a lot more policy levers than, than we have in the West. Um, you know, we've given all over our policy market um, levers to, to the market from, from the state. You know, the Chinese state still retains a lot of a lot of levers that it can can use. But I doubt whether a response to to a, a fallout from a debt default because the ceiling's been breached, which would impact globally, including China, that the Chinese government would have any ability to, to manage that and control it. So where it goes from there, that's anybody's, anybody's answer. So hopefully 
cooler heads will prevail in Congress in the next couple of weeks and uh, we'll see the ceiling renewed. I mean, it's not the first time this has happened. This is unfortunately a, a fairly recurrent process now, that political process that, and the, the Chinese must be just beside themselves with despair because they were observing this from afar and let alone their own economic challenges. Uh, this is a, a global challenge emanating from the United States that nobody wants or needs, including the Chinese. So I don't know what, what else what else one can say because we're all in it together, I think, as we say in Australia now. <laughs> well, they say it's a global economy. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so Michael, finally, I know it's difficult to gaze into the future, but how do you see Xi's imperial experiment playing out? Will the People's Republic come out stronger or weaker because of Xi's leadership? Yeah, that is the $64 question, obviously. My gut feeling tells me, I mean, I do worry from day to day when you've got Evergrande and overflights over Taiwan that one of these can sort of blow all this up. That's probably always been the case if I reflect back. There's always been issues, probably not to the scale there is today because China is just so much bigger and powerful. Um, so that's what we're actually confronting now and, and, and trying to measure and come to grips with. But I, I, I was, my gut feeling always first when I always fall back on this, that Gordon Chang in 2000, I think, tw over 21, 21 years ago, the coming collapse of China. And um, that's sort of entered into our lexicon that China could collapse and is on the verge of collapse. Gordon Chang and he still defends his position and argues strongly today that it's about to collapse. He made very specific predictions that would collapse in two years. So he was talking about 2002, 2004, maybe it would collapse, and it hasn't. For some reason, China is always, and this is my position, China is not always in control of its future and its fate, and it often and always does make mistakes and does things that you wonder why that's just not in your interest to do or say, but it always muddles through. And I think my position would be that it will continue to muddle through. It's not going to all of a sudden re-emerge uh, from a cocoon of economic constraints and stuff and blossom again like it did you know, in, from, the, uh, from 1992, let's say, onwards. But it's going to continue to rise. The constraints will be how much it can devote to national security and defence because it's basically being not open slather, but it, the military has had the largesse of a really strong, powerful, growing economy. That's not going to be the case in the future. So how's the military going to deal with less resources probably going forward? I hate saying going forward, sorry. But so I think that's my position. It will continue to muddle through. It's not going to collapse anytime soon. But I wake up every morning checking to see whether it's, <laughs> something's happened that uh, puts a lie to that. But I've been living that for 20 years, over 20 years. When Gordon uh, Chang published that, that just generated a big debate and a really good debate, actually. Just how, uh, you know, it's a liberal uh, market economy, liberal democracy. Can you have a market economy, which China was and still is, with the state, of course, without sort of a liberal democratic institutions running the place and the rule of law. And we've always said no, and we continue to say no, but China's always defied that. I don't see any reason, unless something really bad happens, that China won't continue to defy our Western logic about how it should run its economy and run its political and legal systems. They're going to sort of make it work somehow. Michael, thank you for your time and for your insights on The Focus. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Lecturer at Flinders University, Dr. Michael Sullivan. That's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed the show. My thanks to our guests, Dr. Michael Sullivan, and to producers Neil Smart and Malcolm Hughes. Thanks also to the Ozcast Network. You can find the focus on the Sage International website at sageinternational.com.au, the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Until next time, it's goodbye from me, John Bruni. Justice is a national legal nonprofit fighting to protect people's health, to preserve magnificent places and wildlife, and to combat climate change. Visit us at earthjustice.org. 
Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.